So today's a chance for the public to look into the kitchen of the SETI Institute to see what the experiments are, the projects we are doing. Uh, one of the things uh, displayed here is um, uh, the observation of meteor showers and artificial meteors. Uh, I'm interested in how may uh, organic molecules from space have uh, arrived on Earth at the time of the origin of life. Uh, I want to understand how organic molecules may have changed when they came into the Earth's atmosphere and light up like a, a meteor. So I'm studying meteor showers for clues as to how uh, organic material may have uh, originated on our planet. Uh, these cameras were uh, uh, flown on a research aircraft to uh, look at meteor showers, to have a really good view of meteor showers in the past. Uh, I'm showing some uh, footage that was taken from the 1999 and the 2001 and 2002 Leonid meteor storms. I'm also showing uh, a video from uh, an artificial meteor that uh, came to Earth just recently. That was the return of the Stardust Zemble return capsule on January 15. Uh, we were out there uh, at altitude, flying in uh, this type of aircraft you used to fly to Europe, for example. Uh, looking out of the aircraft windows to film uh, the meteors and to film uh, the Stardust sample return capsule entry uh, to learn about how uh, these uh, meteoroids may have brought organic compounds to the Earth that uh, may have started life on our planet and to understand how we can build better uh, capsules to bring back examples from comets and asteroids uh, to, to our planet. I'm Friedemann Freund. I'm associated with the SETI Institute and have so for over 16 years. At the same time, I, I'm with the physics department at San Jose State University and uh, at NASA Ames Research Center. I started out my work uh, in the area of origin of life, but then soon became aware as part of that work of a very interesting reaction which has now led me to become primarily interested in earthquake signals and we are trying to decipher the many different signals that the Earth is sending out before an earthquake happens. Many of these signals have been recorded by satellites and they have been recorded by ground stations, but what was missing in the past was a basic understanding why these signals could be generated, how they could be generated, what is the fundamental physical process that takes place in the Earth's crust that leads to the emission of these signals. And most of these signals are electrical in nature. But what we need to understand are processes that would generate electric currents in the Earth's crown. And that is where my work came in, because I was able to show that actually, like in this experiment here, where we have a simple hydraulic press and a piece of gabbro, which is a rock from deep in the Earth's crust. It does not contain any uh, piezoelectric quartz. So any electrical signals that are generated from this rock cannot be related to piezoelectricity of quartz. I have instrumented this by slapping a copper electrode here and another copper electrode through these pistons. These pistons are electrically insulated from the press. So this is a little metal plate, the same down here, and they are electrically connected. And now between these two, I have a amp meter. And when I start pressing this, now this experiment is not the cables, everything is not such a way that it has high quality signals. But what we can show in the laboratory when we do this experiment under good conditions that as soon as I start pressing this rock, release the, the charge and then start pumping up. When, the, when I do this, an electric current is flowing from the stressed rock to the unstressed, through the unstressed rock to this electrode. And these currents are huge. When we blow these up to a cubic kilometer in size, which is not really much for the Earth, we can predict, we must expect that the Earth, when the Earth gets, the crust gets compressed, that this Earth can generate electric currents on the order of 100,000 to maybe as much as 1 million amperes per cubic kilometer. And these currents, once they are 
activated. Once the battery is charged, these currents flow for days, for hours and days. So now we start to understand if we have electric currents building up under the influence of tectonic forces that stress the rocks, we can begin to understand the many different signals that the people have identified from earthquake lights, from the formation of haze and fog and strange clouds, from changes in the radio transmission indicating that the ionosphere is affected. We can use GPS signals to study these changes in the ionosphere. We can send a radar pulse up to the ionosphere and measure how the ionosphere is reacting. And when something is preparing days before an earthquake happens, deep in here, the ionosphere reacts. Satellites are currently looking at the ground to see infrared emission and a French and a Russian satellite mission dedicated to pick up these low frequency electromagnetic radiation that come out of the ground. So it looks that we are now at a position where we can begin to understand. I have to be very careful. There's nothing, we are not, we are still far away from an earthquake prediction system, but we can be begin to understand the physics of the processes that happen deep in the earth that lead to this multitude of electric signals days before an earthquake will occur. I've singled out this low frequency electromagnetic emission that is being picked up by the French and now also the new Russian satellite. And what they are doing, particularly the French, have their satellite, which has the acronym Demeter, uh, is flying for nearly two years, and during the first 18 months, it crossed over the area where magnitude five earthquakes happened, and they, if you add them up all around this time, all around the globe, they crossed over 3,561 earthquakes. What the French that have done is they aligned every single earthquake at time zero and plotted 30 hours before before and 30 hours after and looked at the intensity of the infra of the electromagnetic radiation in the low kilohertz range and they see a distinct signal about six hours before an earthquake an increase in electric electromagnetic radiation in the low kilohertz region and when you go then to the ground stations here the ground station there are 70 ground stations here in california most of them are not sitting on the Santa Andreas Fault, but they are sitting away from the Santa Andreas Fault. That's where these signals are, can be picked up. And they are constantly monitoring what is happening. And when in September 2004, the long-awaited uh, Parkfield earthquake happened in Parkfield, uh, a little bit south of here, along the Santa Andreas Fault, this is when the earthquake happened. These are certain emissions that are well understood. These are a lightning, global lightning uh, intensities that are showing up here. They are called Schumann resonances. But before the earthquake happened, six hours before, the three hours, six hours before, there was an emission of very low frequency, powerful electromagnetic radiation coming from the ground. This is from zero to 10 hertz. So these are something, the range from almost static to something that would come at this speed. And if we blow this up, this lower region, then you see this burst of low frequency electromagnetic radiation starting about six hours before the earthquake. And then when the earthquake happens, these are the seismic signals that are being picked up. Before there was no seismic signal, but there was an electromagnetic signal. So what we want to understand is how do these electromagnetic signals, uh, how are they generated, what do they tell us, and are they reliable indicators that would be observed at many or maybe all earthquakes. But if, even if we don't see them at some earthquakes, but see some of the other phenomena that are being picked up, like infrared emission or haze formation and these other phenomena, then we can still 
built on that knowledge to construct a system that would lead to a early warning of earthquakes, much better than seismologies can probably achieve in current with current technologies.